It was also a time when the aristocracy, who actually had the privilege to marry quietly at home, out of the public gaze, started choosing to marry in church because there was a, as a group they were beginning to feel rather threatened by the growing middle class um, whose wealth was being fueled by industrialization. So many men from very humble backgrounds were suddenly becoming really rather wealthy and so they wanted really to kind of reinforce their class. Um, and one way of doing this was through a very public display of wealth and status um, at weddings, and their weddings were reported in huge detail in the papers. And quite a num I've related quite a number of these stories in the book. Now, wherever possible in the exhibition, um, we've displayed veils and headdresses with the dresses with which they were originally worn. But veils were so important that we chose three to display on their own. Um, so on the, uh, your left, is the veil worn by Eliza Penelope Clay, which is Honiton lace, so that's British-made lace. Um, and on the right is the most magnificent Brussels lace, Point de Gars veil. And uh, Point de Gars was a Victorian term, and it was because this, this very fine handmade needle lace was, it had a very gauzy um, appearance. It was extraordinarily expensive um, to buy something of this quality. And it was purchased by an heiress, an American heiress, called Roxana Atwater Wentworth. Um, she was an only child. Um, her father was mayor of Chicago and a very wealthy man. And she married after he died. Um, and her husband was Clarence Winthrop Bowen, another very eminent um, American and newspaper proprietor. They married in Chicago in 1892. And according to family history, the veil was exhibited the following year at the um, Chicago World Fair. And lace was very prestigious um, in the late 19th century, and many women were buying antique lace um, to show off their, ta their, their style and to get that kind of unique quality that people like with vintage today. Now, both Queen Victoria and her daughter-in-law, Princess Alexandra, who we can see on the screen, wore harness and lace for their weddings. Because just as Catherine Middleton um, recently wore silk um, made from silk grown from British silkworms uh, for her wedding, and uh, the Royal School, Royal School of Needlework played a great role in making the dress, and we had a British designer and a British design team constructing it. Um, so Queen Victoria and all royal brides from the past uh, went to the same efforts to dress um, in British fabrics. So their dresses were made from silks woven in Spitalfields in East London, and they had honnet and lace. Now, no book or exhibition about wedding dress can uh, avoid um, addressing the thorny question about how influential Queen Victoria was on wedding dress. Um, I can categorically say that she was not the first bride to wear white. Many brides wore white before her. She was not leading fashion, she was following fashion. But she is very important um, because in wearing what we call a white court dress, which is really an evening dress appropriate for wear at court, and that involved wearing a train with it, in wearing that, instead of a dress woven with silver threads or embroidered with silver, together with her velvet state robes, which were trimmed with ermine, and her crown, she was making a political and a very personal statement. Um, the, the British weren't terribly keen on Prince Albert to begin with because he was German. And um, they, they'd known for ages that the engagement was looming, but they weren't very keen on him. And, but Queen Victoria was madly in love with him, deeply, deeply in love with him. And she was very, very upset that Parliament refused to elevate his rank above Prince. And so, in not dressing as queen for her marriage to him, she was bringing him closer to her in rank. So, in a way, it was, she was saying, I'm not marrying you as your queen. I'm marrying you as a woman of high rank. Um, but, you know, you are close to me in rank, and I'm going to demonstrate this. So, this made a great, great impression on the public. And her wedding was reported. There was a lot of... Um, anticipation around her wedding. It was really rather like Prince William and Catherine Middleton. Because as, as with William and Catherine, it was 
Is it on? Is it off? There was a lot of that before Queen Victoria's marriage. There was a lot of, are they going to get engaged or aren't they? So that went on for quite a few months, and then they did get engaged, and then it was all about the wedding dress. So when the, um, the public were told quite early on that the Honest and Lace was going to be involved, and then uh, Jane Bidney, who made it, um, was really quite opportuni opportunistic about this. And she set up the Vic Victorian equivalent of a pop-up shop um, near St. James's Palace, um, showing the type of lace that she could provide for brides, including Queen Victoria. So the hype is building up. After the wedding, um, the court circulars were sent around the world. I mean, everywhere from New Zealand to North and South America, there were accounts in newspapers of what, what Queen Victoria had worn. But more importantly, there was a huge rash of souvenirs that were produced at every kind of price point, from the very cheap to really quite tasteful. And so really, I think what's so important about Queen Victoria is that she implanted in the popular imagination this idea that the wedding dress you aspire to was white, and it was worn with a lace veil and an orange blossom wreath. And that is what all her daughters wore too, and she had quite a number of daughters. So I think that that's what she did. She made it the dress you aspired to, whatever background or class you were. Silver, you didn't think about silver at this time. This, you wanted to wear white satin, a veil, and orange blossom. Now, by the time Queen Vic the Queen Victoria's eldest son married in 1863, the carte de visite photograph had been introduced, and this was a, a way of reproducing multiples of a photograph. So that, um, and after that, photographs of the bride and groom become increasingly popular. Uh, they had to visit the studio after the wedding, of course, because you had to get your photograph taken in a studio. The photograph on the screen of the Prince of Wales and Princess Alexandra, who was a, princess, a Danish princess, great beauty and a great fashion icon, uh, was issued as a carte de visite for sale to the public, and people collected these images of the royal family. Um, her dress is absolutely amazing. It's just festooned in orange blossom, and her husband described her as a rustic goddess, which I think was very nice. But even, ro even royal brides were thrifty, and immediately after the wedding, Princess Alexandra took the dress, to a, not to the dressmaker who'd made it, but to a different dressmaker, and all the orange blossom and lace was removed, and it was um, remodelled as an evening dress. And that's how you see it today, if you see it at Kensington Palace. So it's very interesting that that thriftiness was deeply ingrained um, in women at that time. Now, one of the themes of my... Oh, yes, for the royal family, um, this photograph promoted a very positive image of the future king, who was far better known for his misdemeanors than for his good behavior. And it positioned him as a husband and future family man. And I think it also introduced his Danish bride to the public in a very intimate format, encouraging loyalty to the crown. The development of new ways of disseminating images from fashion plates and photographs to films shown in the cinema and then on television and now on the internet and their effect is one of the themes of the book. And I think it was very interesting to me to find out how women learned about wedding dress. When I started assessing the collection for the exhibition, I had several criteria in mind. First of all, the dresses had to be in, be in good enough condition to travel to several overseas venues. And after the exhibition has been here, it's going to the National Museum in Singapore and then on to the State Historical Museum in Moscow. They also had to carry my story, so I'm afraid being beautiful wasn't always quite good enough. Um, I did a lot of research in 19th century newspapers and magazines, which carried very detailed descriptions of society weddings from the 1840s. And these helped me to track wedding fashions and to be alert to change. And because of this, I became particularly interested in the way designers challenged and refreshed the white wedding dress tradition to make it relevant to new generations of women. When Clara Matthews married in 1880, most bridal dresses were st still trimmed with orange blossom, very like the Princess of Wales. Worth, Charles Frederick Worth's use of pearls was not unique to him, but the dress illustrates his claim to be a fashion leader, and it shows his mastery of effect. And when, we, when I chose this dress, um, the textile conservator working on it had to test every single tassel of pearls.